site did actually say, and as part of the talk, I was supposed to talk about how I became a beloved professor. And I'm like, well, I've been called a lot of things in my life, but I don't know about that. But <clears throat> we'll go to the start of the idea for this talk. And it started as a commencement speech, um, actually. Um, I'll get this out of the way. <clears throat> and in 2018, and I was racking my brain to figure out what to say, because again, this is for the graduates. This should be something that's memorable. It's gonna just, you know, they're gonna remember this, they're gonna be thinking about it, it's gonna be magical. And all I could say was, I don't know. And it was holding me back. I, it really was holding me down. I just, I don't know, I don't know. So what did I do? I went and I watched a bunch of commencement ceremony speeches just to try to get some ideas, you know. I didn't want to like steal any ideas, but boy, they were good speeches. I'm like, God, that would be great to do, but uh, it's been done. And so I just kept going, I don't know, I just, I don't. And then I'm like, wait a minute, embrace that. That's what I do for a living is figure out what I don't know. And I'm like, then the speech actually came together. Now I only had about 10 minutes for the commencement speech. So here today I get to kind of flesh it out and open it up for you today, so, which is kind of exciting. And again, I still want this to be something that's memorable, right? You know, it's gonna, you know, wind beneath your wings, lift you up where you belong, everything is awesome, you know? I, well, regardless, I'm not singing any of them <laughs> because for those of you who know me very well, um, my voice has been, oh, what's the word? Screeching, that's what it's been compared to. So I'm not singing. Um, and of course they're 80s, what do I know? <laughs> so I found this wonderful quote from Maya Angelou right, that says, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And again, I'm kind of hoping that that's what this will do, is, is provide you with a sense of, you know, that poignancy, understanding, and how does it feel to be saying, I don't know? but being okay with it, because it does really weigh on us in classes, um, identity, belonging, any of that. And so <clears throat> I wanna start with how many times do you think you will say I don't know in a lifetime? Or even just in your four years here, which for some might feel like a lifetime, I get that. But you know, think about a research project, you're trying to figure out your senior seminar project, right? Think about the pressure there. Um, maybe it's a sophomore group project. Maybe it's just getting ready for a test or an exam. Um, again, belonging. Isla Moore did one of these talks last year um, on the, the power of not belonging. And she talked about this idea of, of people going, well, who gets to say whether I belong or not? And how do I feel about where I feel I belong? And so this was one of those other I don't know questions. And it was something that I was dealing with too for the long, long time about my own identity, right? before I came out to everyone as a gay man. And then of course we've got just the, the, the general sense of when you have an I don't know moment that stops you. Don't let it stop you, keep going with it. Keep saying I don't know. That's the power of that, okay? And so within the context of digging deeper into I don't know. I then also wanted to find out, okay, what have some other people said about this? So Gilda Radner, one of the founding members of Saturday Night Live, celebrating its 50th a year, I believe, this year. Um, life is about not knowing, having to change, taking the moment and making the best of it without knowing what's going to happen next. Delicious ambiguity. I love that part of the phrase. I just, that, that's just one of the best parts of this. Um, but David Hawkins is a spiritualist, a healer, a physician, psychologist, right? And he's talking here about we have to cross the boundary between knowing and not knowing many times before we come to understanding. And that's where I don't know gets us to. We feel like we have to know something. No. Understanding, comprehension, that can also be kind of an innate feeling. Richard Feynman, right? Sheldon Cooper's hero from Big Bang Theory, if you've seen that. That's not a 1980s TV show. I do know that much. And so again, he's like, as I get older, I realize being wrong isn't a bad thing like they teach you at school. 
It's an opportunity to learn something. And that's one of the big messages that I want to convey about this talk as well, right? The ability to then know and understand. And then Lao Tzu, the founder of Taoism. Not knowing is true knowledge. Presuming to know is a disease. First realize that you are sick, then you can move toward health. Also, to attain knowledge, add things every day. To wisdom, remove things every day. And that's again where I don't know comes in. It helps you to remove some things. And I know at first it's gonna sound a little weird, a little complex, but as we move through the rest of this talk, hopefully that will kind of come into view. Um, but say it, make it a challenge, right? Don't let it keep you down. So one more quote, this is from Steve Allen's book, Dump. All of us know very much less than we assume we do. That's a given fact that we ought to be able to accept, right? And so I thought, okay, if I don't know seems so heavy and negative, how do we reframe it to help us move forward? So instead of saying, I don't know, say, what is it I want to know? Now, oh, maybe that sounds a little more positive. Maybe that's pushing you a little forward into that, okay, I can do this. I can accomplish this, okay? It becomes, it feels more like, okay, success is right around the corner, okay? One of the things that helped me with this is also something, it's, it's a Zen riddle, it's called the koan. And part of the idea of the koan is for the student not to solve the riddle. That's not the point of it. You're not supposed to use your intellect. You're supposed to use your intuition to contemplate it, meditate upon it, and not honestly to come to an answer, but to an understanding. And I've been using this for a very long time. My friends and I, we actually came up with one, and I'm gonna start with it here, and then we'll talk about that intuitive solution, as it were, by the end of the talk. But I want you to kind of contemplate it, okay? Kind of think about it with your own intuition. Don't try to reason it out. What's the difference between a bicycle? I'll just give you a moment. So how did I get here through all of this, right? Well, there's this lovely quote in this book. It's a history of bookshelves, believe it or not. I love books so much, I also love the place they live. And this author also wrote a book on the history of the pencil, which I'm going to be reading next. So I'm really excited about this. This tells you how nerdy I am. But he had this really great quote. Um, Here stand my books, line upon line, they reach the roof, and row by row they speak of faded, faded tasks of mine and things I do and did not know. So sometimes we actually do forget things too. And it, again, then it's also okay to say, I don't know. But it's there somewhere. It's that intuition again, right? That, that word that's on the tip of your tongue. Like right now, I can see a lot of you struggling with that. What's the difference between a bicycle, right? It's, it's right there on the tip of your tongue, isn't it? But again, it's okay to ask for help. Why is it I don't know makes us afraid to ask for help? It's also okay to do. That's part of this whole process that I want to be talking about today. And we can ask our friends, we can ask family, teachers, colleagues, and of course, the almighty God, Google. I'm just saying if you're still paying attention. Um, and again, Isla Moore, who did one of these talks, as I said, of the power, she went and talked to a psychology professor and a philosophy professor to see if they could give her a little bit of assistance in figuring out the idea of belonging. And they wouldn't give her any answers. They just kept giving her more questions to ask. And, and this is a direct quote from her talk, it pissed her off. But it also drove her harder. She, wanted to, she really wanted to figure this out, so she's like, you know what, fine. I'm gonna do this in spite of you, okay? I'm gonna take care of this. And it drove her on. Uh, and if you get a chance, her talk, all the talks are on the undergraduate research. You've got a YouTube channel. Um, all the talks are there. Uh, it, it was just really fun and inspiring to listen to hers. And I kind of feel like mine's a little bit of a continuation of hers. From this idea of not belonging to now saying I don't know to add to the journey. So again, part of how I got here was I saw Star Wars in the theater when it first came out, like the first movie, episode four. I was probably, I don't know, I'm 100 now, so that was what some, I, I can't do math. Um, this is the book I read. I've had this book since fifth grade. This actual book, I know because inside the front cover is the address I lived on, 3910 West Rushholm. 
And I even misspelled it. <laughs> I just noticed that. You, you can see the tape. I read this book 20, 30 times. I just, reading, reading, reading. But then all the way through high school, you know, people were like, oh, you're so smart. You should, you should become a medical doctor. This is what you should do. And I thought, okay, that's what I should be doing. But I loved reading so much. I'm like, how could I possibly turn that into a living? I don't know. And that kept me from pursuing it. I went and became a, a chemistry major at the University of Iowa. I was a pre-med for two years. I got all the way through Organic 2, Physics 1, Calc 2, I'm not sure how, but I did. But it was just, there was something that was weighing on me, and I just couldn't figure it out. And Dr. Amanita in psychology did one of these talks as well. And in his, he was talking about this idea that he, he was homeschooled, and he would read stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of books, and those were his education. And as I think back upon it now, I'm like, yeah, that, they were. That was my education. That was what was building up to this, this trip of I don't know and getting to where I needed to build up into who I am. Uh, if you're interested, his talk is The Power of Positive Indigenous Psychology. Okay? And again, that idea of the books being my education, fifth grade, as I told you, Star Wars loved it. So over here you can see Robert Heinlein's book, Starship Troopers. Robert Heinlein is a famous science fiction fantasy author. He started writing in 1939. He died in 1988. And my uncle gave me a five-book box set of Robert Heinlein science fiction. Now, I'm sure he just went to the bookstore and said, look, I, I need to find something for my nerdy nephew who likes science fiction. What do you got? And they probably handed him this box set. It is still to this day, and I have all five of them, the most important gift that really turned things around for me. Robert Heinlein talks about sexual identity, which I was struggling with at the time. He talks about all these really interesting ideas that, again, are, 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 be, are coming into being now, right? Like, you know, moving sidewalks, right? He was talking about that long before that was even coming into being as an invention. Um, but... I, and I tell my uncle every time I see him, every summer, thank you. You helped me learn more about me, whether you realized it or not, with those five books and that one gift set. Um, it helped me ask instead of I don't know, what do I want to know about me? And then I read everything Robert Heinlein ever wrote. <clears throat> I have all of that stuff. Um, and so I go to college, right? And again, I'm a chemistry major, pre-med. But I took an English gen ed course. Yay, gen eds. They're super powerful. This one changed my life again. This woman here, Dr. Valerie Ligorio. She taught a literature and culture of the Middle Ages class. <clears throat> Excuse me. As I said, I've been teaching part of the day too, so my voice is probably going to start going. <clears throat> And the literature and culture class was, she brought in guest speakers, but she was incredibly dynamic. And one of the things I really loved about her, and this is kind of a tangent, which is, is how I teach my classes, for those of you who've taken classes with me, you all know this. I, I eventually get back to the topic at hand, don't worry. This was when you could still smoke in the classroom. And did she? She would have a, she, the long brown cigarettes. She'd have one going as she's teaching the topic. She's talking about the Middle Ages. And when this one went out, she had another one going. I'm not sure how the sleight of hand worked, but she never, never was without a working cigarette. Um, and it, was just, it just blew my mind. But again, also, what she did for me to be like, you know what? Those books that were my education... I can now, I can do this. This can be something I can do that is a passion for me. And part of I don't know, don't always struggle with finding the answer. Sometimes allow for it to just maybe simmer, not boil over, simmer, and it'll find you. I feel like this found me. The passion found me this time. And I became an English major. And that's what I did. And so... I went 
<clears throat> I had quite the journey from the University of Iowa. I went to Western Michigan for my master's and PhD in medieval history. And I still didn't exactly know what I was going to do. I'm like, I love school. I love the education. I love the English. I know I can do reading for a living. I just don't know exactly how. So let's just keep getting another degree, PhD in history. Uh, and again, another lovely serendipitous coincidence. The word history, historia, comes from ancient Greek, which means to inquire, to ask because you don't know. I'm like, this is starting to come together. I love, the gods are just looking down on me. So I took this opportunity, and instead of going, all right, what do I want to do with this? What can I do then to become a better teacher? Because I was TAing at the time, and I discovered that that was another passion. I hadn't expected to teach either, but they, somebody left the program. They're like, can you take over this class for this semester? Sure, let's do that. And again, suddenly the passion found me. It pulled me in and help me add one more step away from the I don't know to what do I want to know to do something even better and bigger. Um, and then in my last year uh, as a PhD student, I got hired here at Fort Lewis College. It's been a 20 year magnificent journey of constant I don't know, because now I had to take it to another level. The I don't knows to another level. Now I had to produce I don't knows. My teachers have been doing it to me the whole time, right? Giving me tests, making me write papers, making me... Now I was creating some of that I don't know. So it was shifting on me. And sometimes the students will get me to say it. And it's either because I knew it and forgot it, or I don't know. One of them, just today in class, we were talking about Alexander the Great, and one of the students was asking me about, you know, the number of losses, the battle losses, what was the comparison. I'm like, honestly, I don't have... I've never read anything about that. I'm going to go look. And it excited the hell out of me to say, I don't know. What is it I want to know? So the other frustrating thing for my students is, I always tell them, I want you to leave my classes with more questions than answers. Because the learning will continue. It can't help but continue. Right? And again, they also get a little annoyed because I won't just give them the answer. Right? They're like, well, what, what's the answer about this? Like, look it up. Say, I don't know. All right? And then bring it back and let's talk about it. Because one of the really interesting things is, how, not just about how you get to an answer, but how did you not get to the answer? All right? That's going to add much more in the way of, of understanding your I don't know process All right? and figuring out what you really want to know. And so after I took my second class with Valerie Elgorio um, as an undergrad, I did officially become an English major. No, I didn't go back for the secondhand smoke, um, but I did go back for her, and it, she was still smoking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my Shakespeare professor did too, uh, now that I think about it. Um, but, you know, I still enjoy the stems. I still love saying, I don't know about how can I still incorporate that also into it, because it's also really actually in the family. It's in my genes, because my grandfather, I had to take his ninth grade geometry class. And everything was great for the first month, and then the students found out that he was my grandfather, and then I caught hell. They were like, can you get your grandfather to stop yelling at us? I'm like, no, that's how he talks. And you don't have to eat dinner with him. He comes over and asks me math questions at dinner. He's like, hey, Michael, you know, I'm, I'm, I was thinking about class today. I'm like, mouthful, I can't talk. He's like, no, no, give me how many ounces in a gallon of milk? Come on, let's start there. I'm like, sorry, mouthful, can't talk, can't talk. He's like, I'll wait. <laughs> Grandpa. So Grandpa was a teacher. Um, and when he passed away, uh, my grandmother found his ties, at, you know, he had retired, in a, in a shoebox. And she gave me that shoebox. And this is one of his ties that I'm wearing tonight. Um, and part of that. So... Yeah, I miss him. Yeah, let's see. I think he had about 30 ties in that shoebox. <laughs> Took a lot of ironing to get them all fixed. <clears throat> right? The greatest teacher failure is Yoda and the Last Jedi. 
again, I kind of take a little bit of issue with that because again, just like I don't know, failure seems to be like a finalization, right? That it's done, it's over with, there's nothing more you can do about that. And that's not true, right? As long as you pick yourself back up, right? So I honestly have changed it a little bit to the greatest teacher assistant failure is. That kind of works. I'm going to change off the slide real quick now because, yeah, it's creeping me out too. Don't worry. Um, we're, we're moving on. We're moving on. But I'm seeing it everywhere, right? In young Sheldon, George Cooper was a football coach. At one point, he's giving a speech to his team, and he's like, you learn more about failure than you do with success. And even if you lose the game, you are not a loser. And Sheldon, in, in the Big Bang Theory, was watching the videotape of this, and he actually changes the word failure to setback. And I like that. Because setback f feels much more like it, that can be fixed. I can fix that. And so, and I, you know, I love this particular toy because it's a, it's an, I love action figures. And I love Batman. Sheldon Cooper wearing a Batman t-shirt. What could be better? Um, and I know some of you are also still sitting out there going, you know, failing a test sucks. Yeah, it does. But if you fail it and then walk away, then yeah, you failed. But if you fail it, you've still learned something. Right? Even, my, even my college roommate, who he was taking an organic chemistry test, and he, there were five questions. He answered four of them really well. The second one, he just could not figure it out. So he drew a picture of the Parthenon. Beautiful picture of the Parthenon. And eventually, he was able to make a connection between why he drew the Parthenon and what the question was. And I, was, I, I don't remember the question. I was trying to get in touch with him to see if he could remember it too, but this was many years ago. But there had to have been some sort of connection there. But now again, as a professor, and, and I'm the one that really has to create my own I don't knows, and what do I want to know? So I had to go start researching. Researching the topics that interested me because it wasn't just what I wanted to know, but it's like, What's missing out there that others should also know? And so in the, in the upper left there is the Vatican Library reading room where I've worked. The bottom is the Paris Bibliothèque Nationale, and then the upper right is um, St. Gall, Switzerland. All places that, again, I had to go and ask them how to do this. I'm teaching our senior seminar class this semester right now, and over the summer, most of the students went and did archival research, which was fantastic to listen to their stories, the excitement, because every one of them before they left were like, I don't know how to do this. I'm not sure how I'm going to accomplish this. And we're like, you can do this. Because it isn't that you don't know. What is it you want to know? Run with that. And boy, they came back with a ton of information, all of them. It was so exciting to see. And just to listen to their stories, the excitement. Because now, sorry, projecting. <clears throat> I'm like, now you have to write this up into a, a paper. And they're like, oh. Crap. I don't know how to do that. I'm like, no, you don't. But that's my job to help get you to what you want to know. Let's work on that, right? And they have a research advisor who's a you know, specialist in the field. Um, and so again, to see that evolution, right? And go, I've been there. I've done that. But now I'm having to take it to this next level, right? Because writing my own books, I'm trying to figure out what's missing in academia land. And so one of the things, you know, in, in school, right, and in Western Civ this happens, we, we talk about, you know, the great events, the great people in history. And I'm always like, but what about the rest of us? What about me? Where am I in history? And that's what then fueled my own personal research for my academic research. I study medieval sermons, and I study medieval Irish um, psalm commentaries on the Psalms. Why? Because they were written for me. They were written for the common people. They weren't written for scholastics and you know, theologians and you know, big brain people. They were written for me. Well, I have a big brain now, but before that. Um, it was exciting to then find me in history. And so that I don't know, again, that identity of who I was, was continually building and building again out of the historical research I was doing because I wanted to know. Right? I wanted to be able to explain this stuff you know, to others who maybe aren't academics either. Right? My family, they're not academics. They, they love what I do. But then I can also be like, hey, let's have a great conversation about this. Tell me about your day. Tell me about your work. Let me tell you about mine. 
here's how we're building these connections. And then we can interest people more and more and more because I don't know. So just real quick, so <clears throat> on the left over there is the first page of one of the Psalm commentaries I'm currently working on for my, my current book project. Um, and yeah, everything is in Latin, so I've had to learn how to read Latin, medieval Latin. Um, and you can see at the top there, right in the red, right, it says incipiunt, eclogi, tractatorum, in salterium. That means this is the beginning of the eclogi. And an eclogi is basically somebody taking different books and pulling out all the important good stuff and putting it in their own book. Which then crafts actually a different and new message, which is exciting to discover. Because now we're reading those other books in different and new ways and relearning. We get to say, I don't know again about those. right? And, and treatises on the Psalms is the last part of that. And then on the right here is, is my latest book came out in March of 22. Uh, I assisted with this, uh, the Bible in Early Irish Church, AD 550 to 850. Because again, I'm like, how are we expressing this so that everybody can can come into this? Because this, the Psalms aren't easy to read. If you've ever read the Psalms, some of them can be pretty complicated. Some of them are like, I'm not quite sure what that means. So people want to explain it. But the text I'm now working on has boiled it down even more. Again, for everybody to read. And that's what's really excited me again about this talk is, I still don't know what I'm doing. But every day I plug away, at least for an hour. That. So also part of this message is the power of un. And Isla Moore again, another person who's, she's moved on to another university, but when she was here in the Center of Teaching and Learning, made me say I don't know every day of my life about my teaching. It was great, she was such a great mentor. She still is. Uh, she lives a couple blocks up from me. She walks down by my house all the time, waves, sometimes with one finger, sometimes with the whole hand. I don't know. Um, but she always said to expect the unexpected. And I found it, you know, with Oscar Wilde, of course. But look at all the different uns that we think about, right? I mean, even on this banner right here, an uncommon way to learn. Isn't that great? An uncommon way to learn. And Dr. Amanita, again, in his talk, talked about his homeschooling, and he called it unschooling, right? Curiosity-driven learning. And again, I love that aspect of it because we do need to unschool ourselves. You know, we come to, school, come to college from high school, and we're taught, you know, we've been taught the five-paragraph method, right? Intro, body, 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 conclusion. Well, we need to unschool ourselves, break out of some of these, and test new waters. Maybe we go back to that. That's fine but at least we've taken that risk and we failed or had a setback, did a reset, and we're like, okay, I'm going back to what I'm familiar with, but I've got something to add to it to make it a little better, right? I unschooled myself. And so as part of that is I do ungrading, and I can see eyes rolling already because I talk about it way too much out, you know, on campus, and I, I, so I won't talk too much about it to you, but uh, it comes from this book, Ungrading, Susan Blum. But then there's also this other book, Jose Antonio Bowen, Teaching Naked, How Moving Technology Out of the College Classroom Can Improve Student-Teacher Interactions. And the ideas in here, again, it's the ungrading. I don't do any grades in my classes. Everything is assessed narratively. I give a grade midterm in the finals because the school makes me, and, but it's the process of learning. I want to see what... A grade is not going to help if you don't know what you're learning it for. If you're just cramming it in to get a test and then a grade and you're done, even getting an A sometimes can impede learning. Right? Again, that's why we talk about failure or setbacks. You, know, you can learn from them. Right? It's easier to teach change after failure than after success. And so I want my students to work on that, and it's product and process. Students focus too much on product, the paper they want to finish writing. But it's what's the process you went through to get to that? What did you learn about your writing skills, your learning skills, your ability to critically think, analyze, come up with a new idea? That's what I want to see. And let's say you had a really bad week, right? Maybe you got COVID. You've all heard of that, right? Um, and you just, you know, you couldn't finish the paper well. You turned it in. It was really bad. I mean, literally, one time I had a student come up to me 
they had their arm in a cast. And instead of with their good arm, they took their arm in the cast and handed me their paper so I could see that they had broken their arm and they'd had trouble typing their paper because it was just, it was really super hard that night and they were on their pain pills and gin and tonics and they were just and I'm like, whoa, time, just stop, I'll take the paper. When you're feeling better, let's, let's redo this, let's relearn this. Um, and that's what ungrading is about. You know, life intervenes sometimes. It's also about them learning how to remember things and not memorize things. Right? Memorization has its place, don't get me wrong. But once you start remembering that stuff because it's your passion, it's your interest, it's your like, you're no longer memorizing. You really are remembering it, right? And that's the fun part is when you get over that. You know, I tell students, it's like, you, how many song lyrics do you know? Like thousands that you've memorized. They're like, yeah, but it's, it's put to music. I'm like, so do it for class. In high school, we had to learn, I think it was like the electrolyte order of all the, the chemicals. And so our high school class, we, we put it to music. And I can't actually remember all of it. I just remember the last three. And the last three lines, and I'm not going to sing them again. Again, it would be screeching. So people go. Silver, platinum, gold. Right? I remembered that much. Right? But again, you can do that. that. Again, that's what the ungrading process is about, is the learning process, not just product. Remembering, not just memorization. Right? And, and Jose Antonio Bowen has, has another really good quote here. It may seem ironic that reducing technology in the classroom should be a core strategy for higher education in a new century. But it is exactly what we all want from our doctors, our arts, our religious organizations, and even our restaurants. We want the power of a global economy, but customized and delivered in person. You know, AI has its place, right? It can have its uses. But also, too, then, how do we then personalize after that? Take the next step, right? The I don't know. My students use Grammarly. And I'm like, okay, however, don't just let it fix it for you then. Let it tell you, I don't know that this works well. Then you fix it. Personalize it. Make it you, right? You can check to see what Grammarly suggested, and you're probably still going to go, eh, no. That's not quite me. But I can see the benefit, right? Maybe there's a word you do want to take from it, and you incorporate that, but it's still being personalized, right? And delivered in person, right? So there is that connection, right? Yeah, je ne suis pas. I don't know. And you're looking at this, and you're like, what's an orange and an orange vest doing up there? My friends and I, we came up with this over 25 years ago. We'll be talking on the phone, and at one point, she'll say an orange. And I'll say, because a vest has no sleeves. And even though there isn't knowledge behind it, there's intuition behind it, and a connection of 25 years of the joy we brought each other in studying, in being frustrated by our teachers, in not knowing how to do things. But it reminds us of all of that from this. It's that intuition. It's what Maya Angelou was talking about, about the feeling you leave with. And that's what we have. Yeah, we just, what's the difference between a bicycle? An orange, because a vest has no sleeves. That's it. That's all there is to it, okay? And then there's one other last thing I, I like to leave my students with. Once a student of mine, always a student of mine. Because if you ever run into another either small or monumental I don't know moment, you can always come back to me. You don't have to be taking a class with me. And even for those of you who have never taken a class with me, shame on you, by the way. <clears throat> you're all part of this Fort Lewis community of people saying I don't know every day. Right? We're all a community of learners. We're all students of one another. And so we're always going to be students of one another. Alumni, students today, faculty, staff, right? And so that's certainly the one thing I always like to leave my students with at the very end of the semester. Because of all the things, all the things in this world that I absolutely do not know, that is the one thing I do know. Oh. <laughs>